Hello everyone. Welcome to the newest episode of Weekends with Amit. This is your host Krishano and today's subject before we go into today's subjects let us understand one thing very clearly. The general understanding is that emotions like love do not follow any conventional logic. Therefore, it is very difficult to put it into laws, make it predictable, things that generally science do. The question is, is there a science of love? And today, to discuss this, we have our two distinguished guests, Professor Amit Goswami oh. and Dr. Valentina Onisar. Thank you so much for joining us today. The subject is, is there a science for love? I am sure Professor Goswami have, has a very good understanding of how to make science or how to make science out of love. Or should I say love out of science? Let him be the judge of that. Over to Professor Goswami. Thank you, Krishanu. Well, love is uh, something mysterious unless you look at it from the point of view of quantum physics and quantum science. The mystery of love, I think everybody knows. Yes, it is a mystery because ordinarily we are built as somebody who is not very friendly with any stranger. Anybody who is not me, we are built. Our immune system is built to distinguish between me and not me. And therefore, that immune hostility and at least translates into a defensiveness. I have to be ready to defend myself. Who knows what this stranger will do? And this word stranger is now applying to anybody. Why do some strangers convert themselves into relatives? Mother, you can understand. We, after all, come out of the belly of a mother. But father included, any stranger is just a stranger. Even the baby has beginnings of immune system very much. So why isn't there defensiveness? Or maybe it is and we don't see it. Yeah, that's the key. Maybe it is. But it does go away. Where does come from this inclusivity? This is what you have to clearly understand. Love is a relationship between two people in which we have the power to include the other so that we are not hostile include the other within the definition of me. If the other is me, then I'm not distinguishing between me and not me, and therefore I'll not be hostile or indifferent. How does that happen? This is the mystery. What is involved? Now, of course, in social interaction, scientists have now have some understanding. We have in our brain mirror neurons which mirrors the behavior of another person that is taking place right in front of my eyes in this way if i see somebody laughing or crying i start laughing or crying as well unless i consciously control myself from doing so well known phenomena right how does that happen Scientists now say that, well, the mirror neurons are mirroring the behavior of the other. And so you are experiencing directly the emotion of the other as your experience. And therefore, you start laughing or crying as such an experience would demand from you. No mystery there. But when mirror neurons are not involved, But then, sometimes there is no way that there is any behavior which suggests emotion from the other. This way or that way. Then mirror neuron have nothing to pick up and 
nothing to reflect and nothing to give you experience. But even so, it is the fact that you experience very much of friendliness, goodness, or in some cases, even romance with people. How does that happen? You include your ability to include the other within your consciousness, within your definition of yourself. How does that increase? Newtonian physics and materialist science and conventional thinking, any kind of rational thinking, does not explain this, cannot explain this. Why does quantum physics qualify as a science of love? Because quantum physics can answer this. In quantum physics, not only can we communicate through local interactions like the mirror neurons, but we can also communicate via what is called non-local interaction. Local interaction takes place by virtue of local signals passing from one body to the other. For example, we see another person crying or laughing. How, we, how do we get the information? We get it through seeing. The local signal of light travels the distance between you and the person and hits your eye and you see, etc. Are you here, etc. All through local signals. But if there is nothing particular to see in the other, then it's not local signals that is doing anything. Certainly mirror neurons are not involved. Then what explains this kind of feeling that is called phenomenon of altruism? A person is needing help, is in distress, and most people are able to stop and help. Or as I said, this phenomenon of romance. You see a person of the opposite sex usually, and all of a sudden, you have this ability. You have this feeling that you call, oh, it would be nice to know the person. Or maybe even I'm in love. Such love at first sight is an exciting phenomenon. It has been known and reported since time immemorial. These are the mysteries of love, right? And what I'm saying is quantum physics answer it by virtue of the fact that in quantum physics, in quantum science, it is possible to transfer information without signals. This is called non-local communication, without signals. How is that possible in view of the relativity theory, which says that all communications must be local, must involve a signal with a speed limit, the speed of light? It does it because consciousness operates at a different level than the space-time level in which matter operates. This level is called domain of potentiality. Got it? Non locality. In the domain of potentiality, we can be connected. We can be connected if we correlate. That's a quantum concept. Correlate is an intention to relate. Correlate. We become participants in a correlation. Correlation does require local interaction, but that is happening. You are seeing the person, that's the local interaction. That correlates you in that domain of potentiality, which is actually our unconscious. As soon as you see a person and something like love happens, we become correlated. That's the first thing. And as soon as you have become correlated, you are able to communicate non-locally. See? What do we communicate? What happens? These are the kind of things science can explain. So in the case of love, the explanation is very simple. What happens is that the momentarily, the immune system suspends itself. That may not be function 
is just suspended. So there is a deeper, this goes much deeper than this. It turns out that the immune system in the form of thymus gland resides in what psychologists more and more are recognizing as a center of feeling for us in the body. In the East, in the India, this was called the heart chakra, discovered millennia ago. This is where love is, they used to say. Love is where the heart is. Transfer this at home is where the heart is. When you make love your home, then you are a lover. Heart chakra. And we now have, thanks to quantum science, the science of the heart. How to make the heart loving? Because heart ordinarily, as you know, is just a pumping machine. It's a pump, pumps blood. Very useful, of course. And it helps all the body's organs. So very, very fundamentally useful organ, one of the major organs of the body. But still, it's just a pump. Newtonian physics applies to a pump. That's why you can supplant a heart with a you know, iron pump, and that works for a while. So what is the mystery here? That such a pump can do such a quantum thing as non-locality. The mystery is that as the immune system suspends itself, and you can participate in it, you participate in it by giving up your defensiveness. It's your defensiveness that holding up the immune system as a shield. Give up that shield. Become vulnerable. So what? If you do that, then occasionally, if the situation demands it, if you are correlated with this person, in other words, if she also allows you to correlate or he also allows you to correlate, both must intend that I would like to know this person, that kind of intention. As soon as that correlation is there, that the heart makes a quantum leap. Heart becomes quantum, literally. Discontinuous change. Heart becomes quantum. Is there evidence for it? Yes. Yes. This is the thing. We have a science of the heart because of such evidence. Heart becomes coherent in its movement, shown by the electrocardiogram, you know, which collects electromagnetism from the heart. And those heart beats show aspects of coherence. Coherence means what? Coherence means movement in phase, like dancers in a chorus. They all dance the same way, everyone. When one's leg moves up, everybody's leg moves up in the same way. Dancing in phase, we call it in a scientific way. This capacity, coherence, is a quantum capacity. And the measurement was showing that, yes, heart and beat become like that, quantum. This was an experiment performed by the Heart Math Institute in California. Amazing, no? So how is then heart does its job? We say it becomes quantum and what quantum objects, non-locality is acceptable, non-locality is permitted. So they are able to communicate non-locality. Non-locality, the two hearts include each other and let each other know as a confirmation, as an energy in the heart, that yes, I'm interested. I also may be in love. That's when you feel the feeling. That feeling is wonderful, no? Some of you have felt heart throb, 
I did it once in my life only. But other times also, you feel something. You feel at least a warmth. These days, you know, I'm kind of old, and so I feel warmth. That's the only heart feeling that I can feel. But when I was young, heart used to go flutter around all kinds of things. So this is one of the mysteries of the heart, and it's scientifically solved. Now, does it give the predictive power? Yeah, we can even give some predictive power that how to, for example, do things, creative things to promote such a quantum leap, how to become loving. So that kind of prediction. We can see, we can show you what to do, what meditations, what movement of energy, vital energy that you have to do, qigong, that can help you being creative and make the quantum leap of the heart. So even if you get married in an arranged marriage, you know, in India, people worry. Even in the West now, people are marrying more and more through internet, through dating social organizations. Very risky. No chance of meeting each other. And still, people have to meet and people have to get serious about relationships. So they meet through this internet and then they date a few times and become serious with each other. Not like around the olden days where people had long courtships and then they would marry. Now it's all fast. So how do you know? How do you establish that loving relationship? You didn't have any experience of that quantum leap. We can tell you what to do. This is why it's a science now. Science of love actually can help people develop non-local relationships with another person. Develop the ability to include others so that you can care about the other, not pretend. If you don't develop love, what happens to this relationship is much of it is pretension. People want to behave in a pretensive way. And of course, they have sex if they are into it. So many people equate love with just sex. Not necessarily. No, love is deeper than sex. And understanding it is possible with quantum science. And experimentally verified that, yes, the heart does develop that capacity. Okay? So how to do it? As usual, for this, we have Dr. Valentino Onisa to allege to answer your questions that you may have. Valentina? Hi, everybody. Uh, by the way, so this is a subject that we study in the fifth and sixth semester in our university. And I imagine all the students are looking forward for uh, this one. You know, but uh, first, let me go on um, what Kishan and Amit said about love uh, being more like a feeling. And of course, it's we speak in quantum science that uh, we see love also as a multifaceted object. And I had this question last week when I had a meeting with some students in Spain and how they said, oh, no way. So love is only a feeling, a sentiment, no? And how can it be an object? And the uh, object in the way that love is an object of intuition. Yeah? And uh, as you know, an experience has these two components, subject and object. You know, love has the lover and the object of love, which is the person or an abstract thing, and also how we think and feel about this person. And of course, love is not uh, independent of experience, yeah, because the only independent of experience thing is only consciousness. So uh, whatever experience collapses, it will always collapse as a lover, the experiencer and the object. Yeah, and when we say object in quantum science, we refer to thinking, feeling, and intuition. Uh, and of course, the intuition of love cannot be experienced as itself. You know, it's expressed in thinking and feeling, higher thinking, higher feeling. Also, now we are talking about this, but don't think that if you understand the words, it's going to take you there. You know, we, we need to also experience and eventually have these quantum leaps of the heart in the heart. And um, 
higher thinking, again, it's intuitive thinking, and that will always have a new component that will will bother us, you know. And if we follow it through uh, with creativity, you know, the stages, it will eventually come as an insight. And then again, it continues to bother us, you know, and then you will clarify what is blocking love in our being, you know, and then eventually we learn to release that. For example, we have the practices on forgiveness, which is one of the best, if not the best, in uh, clearing various uh, such blockages on the path of love, especially working on self-forgiveness. Yeah, that's one of them. Remember, it's always blockages, inner blockages and outer blockages. So take love also as a part of transformation, actually. And if you engage it honestly, it is such. So we, of course, we talk a lot about unconditional love, you know, and with big words, but uh, we don't really understand what conditions uh, we impose, you know. And uh, again, when we have the intuition, things become clear and uh, it's opening us for further uh, exploration, you know, so that's and that's about the thinking part you know? and then uh, of course it's also a feeling as amit said about the heart throbs and it's not about palpitations by the way you know that so uh, the feeling part is also important uh, in order to take us from that me centeredness um, you know it's of course when we say love we we um, we refer to the ability to expand our consciousness to include another person yeah as you know, of course, as mother and child initially have this relation, but then with other people, we have to cultivate it. And yes, this science of love can truly uh, help us get creative about love, you know, if we use creativity to fall in love, you know, and how to make those uh, loving habits that we are trying to build as part of our character, you know, and uh, then this, this, Part of being part of our character will also help us when we need the most. Uh, otherwise, of course, what we experience as love is just coming and going. So in order to make it deep and allow it to transform us, it takes, of course, courage. Yeah. And the question that we can ask ourselves often is, um, how much love am I manifesting right now? Are my actions based on love or on fear? Okay, that's a good one to ask yourself especially when you feel out of impulse to to react to something you know it would be nice if you can pause but that means already that you have some good uh, circuits in the brain yeah um so uh again without the ability of also thinking remember we especially women we know so much we just go on the feeling part like crazy and then we wonder why we suffer because we don't polarize it with the with that higher thinking and without this ability of thinking, we cannot uh, realize what caused those uh, barriers in our beings. You know, what is blocking love? Why uh, we don't feel that state of being complete and uh, why we get dissatisfied again and again. So momentarily you feel that you can do everything, you know, with the heart. But again, this doesn't stay very long. Uh, and then again, heart closes down. So we need to learn how to... Uh, nourish this love relation. Uh, it's truly like when you think of the mysteries of uh, consciousness, it's also the mysteries of love. And uh, uh, without, again, without this feeling part, we cannot really go beyond that misentendness stage, you know. And uh, even with with uh, feeling, we have to really think and then do a quantum leap in thinking as well. But again, intuitive thinking, higher thinking, yeah. And then again, of course, there's multifacets. It's not just romantic. It's love which can be experienced in a truly in a wonderful friendship relation, for example, you know. Uh, and then, of course, this archetypal part is there, which is beyond thinking and feeling, you know, uh, the archetype of love. And but again, we approach it through thinking and and feeling. Uh, so uh, I again, it's not about just to speak about it. It's like we speak about chocolate or ice cream, we have to really uh, jump into this ocean of transformation. But again, in this way, well, that would be a beginning. And then there's a whole science with all the steps and preparation. And of course, I, I how can we even think of a life of quality without love in it? And because speaking of power of love, 
uh, it's also about the capacity to be in love, to manifest love, you know. And love is is one if you want. It's like when you choose just nuances of it, you are already outside of love. You know, it's like uh, you're choosing topics for your pizza. So, but the the experience of our hunger eating pizza is the same, maybe. You know, so this experience of choosing the topic is different than this hunger, if you want. So, and you can go very very far. Like uh, when we are in the heart, what truly happens is that we are really choosing God, the mysterious inhabitant of our heart. Uh, so this is a wonderful, wonderful, um, um, I don't know how to call it, it's not just a subject, no, but uh, it is uh, probably the, I, not probably, for me, I think it's the most fundamental force of transformation and of healing in the whole universe. So, Thank you so much, Valentin. Experience is what definitely is it. Knowing about it, it's basically not even waiting in the sidelines. So, thank you so much again for your valuable input onto this subject. And now, over to Professor Goswami to wrap it up. Thank you, Prashanu. What is left of sex? Well, lots actually, because you haven't given them much details. We are writing a book, and there, when it comes out, you will find a lot more of this kind of details. Or enroll in our course in the, you can look up in the internet. We have a course of um, called, um, I think, Science of Love, Quantum Science of Love and Relationship. You can take that course and find out everything that will be eventually the subject of this book we are writing. I want to end with one more thing that love is teaching I already told you two quantum principles that come into fruition in love non locality and discontinuity. These are purely quantum. No, no, quantum principle. Newtonian mechanics does not have this concept in its vocabulary. So Newtonian objects can communicate only locally and can only move continuously. But of course, quantum objects have both continuous movement in the domain of potentiality, which we experience as unconscious or not experience really, which we have as our unconscious. It affects the conscious, but we have no awareness in the unconscious. And then discontinuity is when we actually experience the archetype of love. There is one more thing. We talked about promotion of love in your being practice. What can you do with the relationships you have? What kind of relationship do you make as you are? I'll bet you make a simple hierarchy of relationship because you don't, won't know any better. Simple hierarchy is one person tries to dominate the other. Of course, both are trying to dominate, both are trying to make simple hierarchy of domination of the other. Loving domination, of course. You don't want to harm the person. But domination never fails. Now realize this. This can become a barrier. However loving you think domination is, nobody likes to be told, you know. Nobody likes to be told that if you do this, then you'll be better. And then I'll be able to love you. As much as the implication. Nobody likes to hear such things. People expect to get respect from their lover. Unfortunately, every time we try to dominate or manipulate the other, we are not respecting the other by any means. Simple hierarchy. One level tries to dominate the other level. Simple hierarchical behavior. You are looking for yourself. In those moments, you are excluding the other. 
You cannot be non-local. You cannot be quantum. If you are simple hierarchical with another person. What is the remedy? What's the answer? The answer I already gave you. You treat the other person with respect. With equality. Realize that the other person is the self just as you are. The other person is not merely an object. Why do you try to objectify the other in order to control the other? Men do it because, you know, women often are kind of non-committal about sex. I've got a headache and they don't like it. They want women to be completely predictable and under their thumb, especially when they want sex. Simple hierarchy. Realize that if you are forcing someone to love you, is it really love? How can a person react to you with expanded consciousness to include you? Consciousness become contracted when somebody is trying to dominate me or not looking at me with respect or specifically, specifically treating me as an object. We do that to objects because we can then abuse them. They are just objects. This is why so much abuse goes on in various places of interactions, private interactions between men and women. Workplace has become dangerous for women these days. Males have become predators. All comes from that simple hierarchy, looking down on the woman, looking at them as objects of pleasure. How does it, as a society, how do we combat with this tendency? The answer is called simple tangled hierarchy. We give up the simple hierarchy and of the tangled hierarchy. We treat the other as it with respect. Tangle hierarchy, what it does, what quantum physics is able to show, what it does is that it gives you a self of the we. You and the other person, when they have a relationship, we are making a plural we. We say that all the time. We, me and my wife is we, me and my husband is we, me and my partner is we. But really do we mean it? as we. A local we is not we. We of locality is shallow. We need we of non-locality. The problem with we of non-locality, where we do include the other, is that non-locality is very temporal. As soon as you have experienced the we-ness, the we-ness dissolves into separateness once again. The problem, the challenge of love is how to keep that non-locality ongoing. Remember that this person I'm trying to be non-local with all the time. I want to be expanded into the person all the time. That's love. And that's the ability that comes when I have a tangled hierarchical relationship. Because I and other have made a self of its own, a non-local we. This is the goal of the relationship. When we are able to do that, then we become a non-local we with the other forever. True love. Can it be done? Yes, it can be done. It also requires eventually quantum leap, but while you practice it, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to give up this really rotten, uncivilized idea of dominating the other. Who needs that? Who needs to objectify? Those who are seeking pleasure all the time. Pleasure from the other without the other's permission. Violating the consciousness of the other. No conscious person wants to be violated that way. When we make a conscious person behave that way, we are treating the conscious person as an object of the machine, as a mechanical being. The 
which is a point. Not only against humanity, against each other. So to learn love, one can require a to practice to be non local with another all the time is what quiet. To follow this new quantum science is what quiet. We create an intense relationship with the other people. In Sanskrit, dancing people have a glimpse of this and they create a full place, beautiful place. When you are in a song, any sort of thing, without art. Then the world becomes your family. The family you don't have hierarchy. Well, the existing family is all the time because I'm exaggerating a bit, but the objective is not to have hierarchy. Family, you can put your hair down. Nobody is going to use you, abuse you. Nobody is going to take advantage of you, dominate you, compete. Everybody is going to accept and love you. That's the idea of family. So this stress, without a Jordan and two, once you develop that character of having this ability, then to have the world becomes your family. If you can make this your goal of it, it's worthwhile, is Thank you. Thank you so much. This was really such a wonderful lesson for so many people. And uh, as you mentioned, there is a combination available here. A lot of people are interested in love relationships, how to live a better life. And as Valentina mentioned it, I'm sure a lot of people will resonate with the idea that this emotion, love, is central to people's existence. Now, how about knowing all about it in a very scientific way and getting a master's or a PhD degree. That's like having your cake and eating it too. Now we have a master's and PhD degree through a fully accredited institution of higher learning in India called University of Technology. And uh, we are offering this course where love is a part of it. As Valentina also mentioned, towards the end of it, love is a part of it, a very important part of it, not just a part of it. If you are interested, you can visit our website, www.amitgoswami.org, or email us at info at amitgoswami.org. You can also visit our Facebook or Instagram page, if you like, and you can send us messages from there, too. We'll be happy to reply to all your messages. Thank you so much. And thank you both of you. See you next week.